Hello everybody, I'm Nick and this one I'm going to show you what is possibly the simplest way to create an API in any programming language and any framework. And we're going to do that with C Sharp and .NET 6, which is currently in preview. Now I know that sounds weird because .NET historically has been notorious for kind of a lot of boilerplate code when it comes down to building APIs. But with .NET 6, there have been some great improvements that allow this to actually happen. And really, the only minimal approach that comes close to this that I've personally seen is Node.js Express approach, which usually comes down to four to five lines of code. But with this, we're going to be even less than that. And it's also very scalable and also very performant. And I'm going to explain a lot of more things as I'm going through the code. If you like a type of content and you want to see more, make sure you're subscribing to the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So here I have Visual Studio. You don't have to use Visual Studio. You can use any ID that you want. But this one for now in preview supports the preview features coming out in November in that .NET 6 version. So I'm going to be using that. And I'm going to show you everything it takes to create a very, very easy and simple API that just prints Hello World when you access uh, the root endpoint. So first I want to create an app and I can do that by using the web application .create builder, And I'm going to grab the arguments from the console application because this acts basically as a console application which exposes an API and then I'm going to do a build to create that app then I'm going to say app.map get and I'm going to map the root endpoint so just o slash here to return hello world here you go and then all I'm going to do is app.run that's it that's an API you can run this you can publish it. It can be a fully self-contained app if you wanted to, so you don't actually have to install .NET anywhere for this to run. You could just publish it in the same way you publish a Go app, which is a purely self-contained EXE. You can do that here, but you can also just install the runtime on wherever you want to run this, the .NET runtime that is, and then you don't have to publish it for specific uh, architectures. So there's a benefit to that. And also the overall build size is way, way, way smaller. This is a very small app to build. And as you can see, this might not look like something you've seen before if you've been exposed to C Sharp and .NET in the past. And that is because in .NET 6, there's tons of features that have been added that allow us to write code like this. And let me just quickly show you this thing actually running. So I'm going to go ahead and say um, build and run this simple API. And this API is now running. And I can go here on Postman and I can click send. And as you can see, this thing actually responds with a hello world. Oh, and just to show you another cool feature coming in .NET 6, I can say hello world reloaded here. I haven't stopped the app. The app is still running here. I can change that. I can hot reload. And now if I go back to Postman, the app did not restart. It's still in debugging mode, but it is responding with the new text. So I can hot reload while I'm debugging, which is very, very useful when you're working or debugging on an API. Now that's cool enough in itself. And app has a ton of other autocomplete approaches and things you can do with it. So it's very, very flexible, very, very extensive. It, they basically abstracted a lot of the things you shouldn't need to worry about. And they give you just the nice things to play with and build your applications. Now, looking at this, you must be saying, oh, Nick, Microsoft is obviously hiding a lot of stuff and there's tons of files that I need to copy around for this to actually be functional. So please give me the truth. Well, I'll give you the truth. If I go into the um, folder in File Explorer, these are all the files there are to the project. And really the only two files that you really worry about is this program.cs. And this is everything that there is in this program.cs. There's nothing else in here. And then the other thing that you really need is this csproj here, which if I show you what it contains, that's all there is to it. Nine lines of code, actually it's seven, but yeah, that's all you need. There is nothing else that you need for this API to actually run. And I can prove that because I can take just these two files, the simple API and the program.cs. I'm going to go at the very top and make a new folder here. I'm going to call it test. And then I'm going to paste those files. So these are the two things that I said we need. Again, this and what you saw before in that XML. And then I'm going to start a PowerShell uh, console here. I'm going to do .NET run. It is going to create a bunch of things to run it, but this thing is now running from that console that I just created. And you can see it's responding fine. So those are the only two things you need. There is no hidden magic there. When you eventually run it, 
the magic will come into the picture, but those are not files that you commit into your GitHub or whatever. Now, how does this compare to the old style of doing things? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this old style API and I'm going to show you the functional side of things first. What does it actually do? So we have a customer's endpoint, which will return all the customers. Currently, we have no customers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create using this body a new customer with my name and I get an ID back. So this is a CRUD API, basically. Now I can go here and I can get that customer by ID or I'm going to go back and list all customers. Then I can go here and update this customer with a different name. And then if I list again, you can see that there is a new name here. And then I can go here and delete this customer. And if I go back to listing, there is nothing here. So this is a very simple, very basic CRUD API. How does that work in the old style of doing APIs in .NET? Let's see that first. So first we have the customer controller here and I just delete that. And you have using statements, you have namespaces, you have attributes here to specify the routing. Then you have to extend classes. Um, we're injecting a, a customer repository. And then we have the endpoints, get all, um, get by ID, create, update. You can see that it's lengthy, it's around 60 lines just for the controller. And the controller, if you've worked with any MVC framework before, is effectively our entry point for our request here. The routing comes through that. Then here's where we have the model. So it's a class, a customer class with the ID and the uh, full name. And then we have a repository. In this example, we're using a dictionary as an in-memory database, but it's easy enough to swap that out for an ORM and the code doesn't really change that much if we use something like Entity Framework. And then you can see what that code looks like. Uh, another 50 lines here, then an interface to make that testable. Then we have the program.cs, which if you remember how it compares to the previous one, it's night and day. And then we have the startup.cs where a lot of the bootstrapping uh, lives. So you can see add controllers, add singleton, uh, a bunch of middlewares and some routing configuration. So lots of boilerplate around 200 lines of code for a simple CRUD API. Now, what I want to do is I want to go here in this simple API example, and I'm going to just uh, delete that. And I'm going to build the same API, the same CRUD API for customers, but using the minimal API approach of .NET 6. So first we need a builder, not an app, because this time we're going to have to do some more configuration on the thing, especially around uh, dependency injection. So I'm going to say arguments here, I'm going to create the builder, and then I'm going to create an app. So the app is builder.build simple enough. And then I'm going to say app.run and that's it. That's the basic building block to run my application. Now you might remember that here we have a customer class with ID and full name. To do that here, I'm going to use a record instead. It's a more immutable type of a class if you think about it. Um, and all I need to do is customer, open brackets, um, GUID, ID, capital I, and string full name. That's it. And now I have my type. And then the other thing I need is a customer repository to manage that data. Now, this doesn't really change from the old system. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy paste that over here. Uh, I added an extra angle bracket and I'm going to delete this interface for this example. I don't need it. So now we have a repository to manage that data acting as the data access layer to our database, fake database in this example. And now first I want to register this uh, repository in my dependency injection container because I don't want to manage like instantiating all that and life cycles and all that for this service. So I'm going to go builder.services.add singleton and I'm going to say add the customer repository and manage it as a singleton in my application's lifetime. Simple enough. And now what I can do is I can say app.map get and I'm going to map my first endpoint, which is going to be the customer's endpoint. And this endpoint needs to return all the customers back to the user. So how do I do that? Well, all I need to do is say from services to indicate that I need something from the service container, the dependency injection container. So I need the customer repository. I'm going to call it repo and then arrow function. And this is where my method uh, is going to return. So what I need to do is unfortunately use a using statement to add this because this is not just automatically um, added. So it is adding a line of code up here. And then all I need to do is say return repo dot get all. That's it. And now I have my endpoint. Now compare this to this. 
it's clearly less code. It's almost half the code and it is doing the exact same thing. Very, very cool. And then I'm going to go ahead and map all the other endpoints, which will work in a very similar fashion. For example, to get one by ID, I need to do map get and then customers or slash, and I'm going to use this angle bracket syntax, which means that this ID is a route parameter. And what I need to do now is comma, and I'm still going to use uh, this from services thing, but I also going to use the GUID ID. And that's all I need, really. The rest will be just automatically done for me. So I'm going to uh, move this back here. And then to return by ID a customer, I'm going to say customer equals repo dot get by ID. And I'm going to put the ID that I get from the uh, parameter here, which is this parameter, simple enough. And then because if it's null, I want to return a not found, what I'm going to do is return customer is not null, because when it is not null, we want to actually return results dot OK, an OK request with the customer object in it. Else we want to return the results dot not found method, which will return a 404. So if I go back and I quickly execute that and I go back to Postman all the way here and I click send, I'm getting a 404 back because that thing doesn't actually exist. Next, we have to actually create a customer. So I'm going to say map post. Post is used to create. So I'm going to copy that customer's uh, text here and I'm going to do a very similar thing again. But instead of um, using an ID in the route, Instead, I'm going to just say customer, which will read a customer from the request body. So this object here, .NET knows that, hey, there's something coming in the request body. Map it to that object if you can. So first, we want to use the repo to create that customer. And then we want to return that it was created. And in a restful manner, we want to say results.created. And we want to specify where that thing was created. Uh, so it can be added in the location URI header. So I'm going to say customers or slash uh, customer dot ID because that's how you access that customer. And then the object itself will go into the body as well. And that's all you need for this thing to work. And then I'm going to fast forward through the last two things, the update and the delete, because they're using principles from what we already seen here, whether that is uh, body mapping or route parameter mapping or dependency injection just quickly show you how this is all wired up together. So as you can see, the update is here. It uses both um, a body parameter and the URI or route parameter and then dependency injection to check whether the customer exists or not and return the right thing and then delete here as well. And really, that's all there is to it. I'm going to go ahead and just run this simple API again. I'm going to go back here and let's run through the full flow again from scratch. So no customers here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new customer. So Nick was created. I'm going to grab the ID and I can go back now and see that Nick is in here. Then I'm going to try to get that um, non-existing one first by ID. This should return a 404 and surely enough it is. And then I'm going to paste the new ID of the customer that exists and I'm going to get them back. And then I'm going to go here and update the name to Tom Chapsis. So Tom Chapsis, sure enough. And then I'm going to go ahead and delete it. And now it should no longer be here. Full CRUD API with literally just, I don't know, 86 lines of code, including a repository. And keep in mind that if you want to plug a real database here with entity framework, this would only add roughly 10 lines of code. So you would have full API to database storage and management in under 100 lines of code, which is insane for any language and .NET specifically coming from that background of being a more boilerplate heavy language. Now, the tech empowered benchmarks for JSON for this new approach so that this can do roughly 800,000 requests per second. And this is something like 40% more than the previous 500,000 requests per second of the controller based approach. Now, you should still be using that controller based approach if you need a more structured uh, solution, especially in enterprise applications. But if you're just starting building a quick API that can still scale, and this is all compliant with async and await, by the way, you can totally have your usual async await um, solution here and benefit from um, that async await scale, then you can definitely use that 
as a production approach. Nothing stops you and you're going to be totally fine with great performance and great scalability. Again, this is all coming out in November as an LTS release and Microsoft is still testing and listening for ideas and approaches for all this. I think it's brilliant and I highly recommend you check that out and give your feedback. That's all I have to do for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you can find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.